Hi, and welcome back to U.S. History with Mr. Snyder. Today we move from the populism era to the progressive era, and the key root word of that is progress, trying to make things better. So let's talk about the different types of reform that were happening during the progressive era. Ooh, fancy. 2010 type stuff. Your learning targets for today. We will identify the causes of progressivism and compare it to populism and what was so different about them. We'll analyze the role that journalists played in the progressive movement and um, how they exposed some of the bad things that were going on. We'll evaluate some of the social reforms that progressives tackled and we will talk about the political reforms that aggressive er, progressives tackled. So let's get started. Some social problems we have that need fixing. The stuff that we've been talking about the past few, the past month, the industrialization, the urbanization, and the immigration brought benefits and social problems, as we've talked about a little bit. This idea of progressivism is that new ideas and human ingenuity, along with honest and efficient government, can bring about an end to these social problems and deliver social justice. It hopes to solve problems that we have in government, business, social welfare, and different labor conditions that need fixing. And the main difference from this and populism is that this is made up of people from all political parties, all social classes, all ethnic groups, and all religions. This is a, a huge movement happening at the turn of the 1900s. So progressivism versus populism, both of them are reform movements. They want to get rid of these corrupt government officials and make government more responsive to the needs of people. And they both want to eliminate big business abuses. But the differences are basically where the movements come from. Progressivism is mostly middle class people who believe that educated people should be leaders and use these modern ideas and science ca uh, techniques to improve society. Whereas populism was just made up of mostly farmers, some industrial workers uh, from the Northeast, but for the majority it was just coming from the farmers. But now this is everybody, and progressivism kind of steals populism's thunder and gets credit for a lot of the things that populism came up with first. So let's talk about the role that journalists play in this movement. And these journalists are called muckrakers. It was supposed to be a kind of a joke, but because Theodore Roosevelt coined the phrase, but it actually became a compliment saying, yeah, I am exposing the uh, social ills and things that are wrong with society. I, I'm playing a role here. These muckrakers are socially conscious journalists who write about the need for reform. Uh, we've already talked about Jacob Reese and his writing of How the Other Half Lives about tenement housing. Uh, Lincoln Steffens shows about, uh, tells about government corruption in his The Shame of the Cities, um, which is a bunch of our essays put together about the corruption of government. And Ida Tarbell is a woman who showed the true side of J.D. Rockefeller and big oil in the history of Standard Oil Company. So all these books kind of uh, basically brought about the need for social reform. And then there were novelists as well. These people can be considered uh, muckrakers, but these people portray human misery and struggle in fictional form. Uh, Upton Sinclair's The Jungle is the most famous one. We'll talk more about that here in a second. But also Frank Norris's The Octopus, which is about wheat farmers and railroad companies in California and what the railroad companies were doing to the wheat farmers. We talked about that during populism. But Upton Sinclair's The Jungle and after is a story of immigrants liberty, living in the slums in of Chicago and working in these dark, meat stockyards. With the butcher and these stockyards, there's no sanitation regulations. It is filthy. From a uh, rats are running all over the meat. There's no refrigeration, proper refrigeration. Uh, employees are washing their hands in the same water that goes into the meat. There's rat dung everywhere. Rats are falling into the meat. 
meat and getting um, processed writing, stuff with it, and, and this crust, is just disgusting, uh, and it's uh, making people sick. Wave of social and it's and fiction, but it really did happen. It comes from a true century. story. And after this book was, was released and it made the people in sick, shoots, Congress passed the, the nation's first laws regulating meat, food, and drugs, it was quite uh, medicine. To watch them so this book single-handedly causes the reform of the meatpacking industry. Of Let's talk about the religion reform, um, the social gospel movement is a Christian movement where we're going to start applying Christian ethics and Christian standards to the social problems such as poverty, crime, alcoholism, slum housing, bad hygiene, poor schools, the dangers of war, and economic inequality. And it comes from the Lord's Prayer. Uh, basically, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So they take this to heart, and they're going to start um, doing God's will on earth. Uh, two things that Christians urged during this time um, were ending child labor completely and uh, gaining a shorter work week for workers. And then there were the settlement houses. And settlement houses are com basically community centers that provide services to urban poor. Most of them were immigrants. Um, they provide nursery school services, kindergarten, they teach English, and they have art programs for adults. So think about kind of a YMCA community center offering all these services to urban poor, and they just happen, a lot of them, to be immigrants. Um, Jane Addams is very famous for this, not part of the Addams family. But she opens what is called Whole House in Chicago in 1913. And it becomes the most famous settlement house, um, providing all of these services and helping immigrants and urban poor. So uh, giving them a leg up, helping them, and giving them a hand when they're down. So children, how do we reform child labor? Um, individual states began banning child labor, and in 1916, Congress even passed a law banning child labor called the Keating-Owens Act, but it was declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. They say if a family wants their kids to work, the government shouldn't be able to stop them. So instead of banning child labor, states kind of take this backdoor route and start passing laws that require children to attend school until a certain age, which is what we have today in our society. So the number of children working drops dramatically and the number of children in school rises dramatically right around the turn of the century in about 1900 is when it happens as is evidenced by these uh, graphs. So children enrolled in public school is rising a lot during this time. But then right around the turn of the century in 1900 is when child labor falls off. And by 1930, it's at only 5% children aged 10 to 15 in school. And so that is what ended child labor essentially was uh, the backdoor route of passing laws requiring kids to be in school until a certain age. Now, how do we reform the adults? Well, there was really a triggering point to this one. In March 1911, there was a fire at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, which made, um, you know, shirts, a shirtwaist, and it kills 146 workers, most of them women, due to managers locking the exits and wanting their people to get back to work. They did not let them out. They wanted them to go back to work and to keep working in this sweatshop condition. And as you can see here, this is a high-rise building. And so the fire just swept through everything. And it, was, it moved so fast that they found skeletons bending over the sewing machines. And so progressives call for reform. Workplaces are made safer. There's codes that m must be followed now. Workers who are hurt at their job now get workers' compensation instead of just um, not instead of getting fired and being helpless the rest of their lives. And they start limiting the workday to 10 hours. But again, the Supreme Court says limiting the workday is unconstitutional in Lochner versus New York. If somebody wants to work 18 hours a day, that should be their God-given right as an American. 
and the government reform efforts that we have. In 1900, a huge hurricane, one of the, you know, we only started keeping track of records in weather records in the 1890s, one of the biggest hurricanes ever, still to this day, wipes out Galveston, Texas, right on the uh, uh, border with Mexico there on the Gulf of Mexico. So the city replaces the mayor with a city commission during this time in order to make all these decisions and get the city back on its feet. And this effort proved so efficient that other cities followed suit. And this becomes known as the Galveston Plan. And so we're reorganizing city government um, to include a mayor and a city commission. And governors Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson are going to bring these progressive ideas to the White House starting in 19, um, 1901 with Theodore Roosevelt and later on in 1913 with Woodrow Wilson. And then there's four different types of reform efforts uh, that we get past during the Progressive Era. And the first one is a direct primary. The party officials of the Democratic and Republican parties used to pick who would run in the general election um, in November. But in different, you know, in Indiana, it's in May, we have primaries. And there we get to vote for the Republican candidate that we want out of the pool of, you know, four or five Republican candidates. And the same thing for the Democrats. It's a direct primary. We get to vote for it. They don't get to pick anymore. An initiative um, puts a proposed new law on a ballot by collecting signatures on a petition. So if you get, you know, tens of thousands of signatures, you can propose a new law and people vote on it in the general election. A lot of these gay marriage laws in California and you see proposed by initiative. And also, citizens approve and reject laws that are already passed by a legislature using a referendum. So a referendum on a law, they don't allow, or they go and vote, and they reject the gay marriage law that was passed. And that's happened before as well in California. Um, and then finally, the recall. Uh, citizens have the power to remove a public official from office before their terms have ended. If they're just so god-awful at their job, we can recall them and get someone else in there who knows what they're doing. You can't do that on a federal level, unfortunately, but we can at the uh, state and local levels. And those are the reforms that made, it was, the goal was to make government more democratic and more in the hands of the people. And those are the reform efforts uh, of the progressive era. Next time we'll talk about women and African Americans and how their reforms were, uh, their needs were met during this era. So I'll see you then. Have a great night.